Honorable Dean, distinguished guests, alumni and friends, and graduates of the best university, best business school in the world, it's my great honor to be here with all of you today. I truly mean it. Why? Because without the INSEAD, I think I'm just a one of those million business women in the world. But today, 10 years after INSEAD, I'm proud to say I am a global citizen. Why is that? 2015 is a historical for the world. United Nations launched Sustainable Development Goal, which is to end poverty, protect the planet, and ensure prosperity for all. And that is the goal for our human being by 2030. The question is, are we really able to achieve it, you know, by 2030? Before we answer that question, I want you to show you some of the historical numbers. Post Second World War in 1960, globally, there's about 200 developing economies. In the period of 1960 to 2008, there's only two economies actually moved from lower income status to higher income status. That is South Korea and Taiwan. China likely to be the third one by 2025. Out of those 200 developing economies in the period I mentioned, there's only 13 of them moved actually from middle income status to higher income status. Out of those 13, eight of them are in Europe. Darn general GDP gap are small. The other five are the Asia Four Tigers, plus Japan. As some of you might know, in the 60s, post-Second World War, it was a common consensus. Africa has a much better chance for economic transformation. Asia, including Singapore, is a hopeless continent. But the reality after 60 years is the opposite. What went wrong? The first thing I want to talk about actually development model. What happened in this part of the world? Because in the 60s and 80s, that is the second industrial revolution. Countries like Singapore, China, Hong Kong, Taiwan, they were able to capture that golden opportunity during industrialization relocation. They were able to create millions of jobs for the people in the bottom of the pyramid. And that is the jump start of those countries' economic transformation. Job creation. It is the key for poverty reduction. Today, before we talk about 2030, the global ending poverty, is there a hope? The answer is yes. Why? I was born in China, 1978. The GDP per capita in the year I was born in China is only 154 US dollars, which is less than one third of the sub-Saharan African countries. In my generation, I witnessed 680 million people has been lifted out the international poverty line in China. According to World Bank, the number of people living under the international poverty line in the world didn't decline if we exclude the 680 million people in China. So the successful model in this part of the world is very important. And the golden opportunity actually is about if you are looking at the GDP in, in China, the GDP per capita in China in 2015 is 7,500. According to China, by 2025, China going to double that. That means at that time, China going to become a high income country. That also means at that time, all those labor intensive jobs currently in China have to move out. Where would those jobs to go? And how much scale of those job relocation? This round of the global relocation is far more complicated because the scale. In the 60s, when Japan was relocating jobs you know, to Korea, they only relocate 9.7 million jobs. In the 80s, when Korea was relocating jobs, they only relocate 2.3 million jobs. Have a wild guess currently how much jobs is in the process of relocating out of China. 85 million jobs. Where would those jobs to go? Southeast Asia don't have enough population to absorb all those jobs. That actually is a golden opportunity, in my opinion, for Africa. At this moment, some of you probably say, Helen, that's just our theory. 
maybe it's not never going to happen in reality. And this is actually how INSEAD changed me and how actually I played a role in the land of Africa. After INSEAD, I went to Ethiopia back in 2011 to set up a shoe factory. It took me three months from design to investment to actual production from Ethiopia to the US market. In the following six months, I doubled the export revenue in Ethiopia in the shoe sector. By the end of year one, I recruited 2,000 local workers in Ethiopia. By the end of year two, I recruited 4,000 local workers in Ethiopia. So within the infrastructure at 2011, I demonstrated export job creation. It is possible in the land of Africa. And because that success, by 2013, I was being asked by the Prime Minister of Ethiopia to become the first Chinese advisor to advise the government. And my first task, actually, is to create the first industrial park in Ethiopia. It took us less than three months without any international advertisement. With the existing industrial park, where it's only eight of factory unit built, 14 of them are still on the plan. I leased all of them to international manufacturers around the globe. People ask me, how did you do it, Helen? The answer is very simple. Success brings success. I invited the investors in and showed them the 4,000 workers I created. And very importantly, using my inside knowledge, I was able to explain to them in a business language, there's profit can be made while you're also creating jobs for the continent. So they just immediately signed the lease. And because of the success actually of that first industrial park, at the same year, I worked with Ethiopia government, first time in their history, got 200 million zero interest loan from World Bank actually to create the second phase of the industrial park. In the past eight years, I've been working with Ethiopia government creating 80 industrial parks. The latest one in Addis Ababa called Havasa Industrial Park is 100% for textile and garments. And with less than two years of the industrial park has already created 40,000 local jobs. And think about it, there's eight of them in Ethiopia. And Ethiopia's success had a big snowballing effect in the Africa continent. Back in 2014, I was being invited by the president of Rwanda. So I went to, as we all know, Rwanda is a small landlocked country. So we're taking, I was taking cottons from Burundi, textile from Uganda, making garments to export to the US. So through industrialization, we make Rwanda from a landlocked country to a land connect country. And in 2015, I was being invited by the president of Senegal to help the government create the first industrial park. It was a great success and now the government is creating the second phase. So there is the industrialization movement has already started in the Africa continent. And without INSEAD, I would never make the career change. I would never have the courage to do exactly what I did in Africa. And second thing I want to talk about actually is about entrepreneurship. Some of, you might, some of the people might say it's easy doing manufacturing, but actually it's very tough in Africa doing business. When I first went there, actually I met the prime minister, I met the minister. They told me, Helen, you are doing 100% export. All your raw material will be tax free. But in reality, it is not the prime minister or the minister sitting at the port clearing my goods. It's a 25 years old junior staff is doing that. So I had a lot of problem. I have the brush to brush the shoes. We've been told it's brush to brush human teeth. It need to be taxed. We have a machine to make a hole in the shoe, lady shoes. They said it looks like a gun, it's an illegal weapon. I cannot even get it cleared, you know, into the country. As an INSEAD graduate, what should I do? Should I bribe them? No, because we learned principles. So what I did, I actually... <laughs> I went to meet the Director General of Tax. Why I meet him? I get his organization chart. I understood he has six deputy director generals. What I did, I went to meet each of them. Why I meet each of them? 
I get the names and the telephone numbers of the next two layer manager below each of them. And then I organized the meeting, inviting all of them to the meeting room. And I prepared a presentation, telling them who am I, why I came to the country, what I've done, and what I plan to do. Most importantly, the problem I have encountered. And afterwards, inviting all of them to the production floor, seeing from the beginning to the end. And then everything becomes rosy. This is a very important thing I've learned from INSEAD. Some of you might be wondering, Helen, why did you took so much effort, you know, in that those poor land doing the things to do those things? You know, in my first visit to Ethiopia, there was some things really touched to my heart. The first thing is, actually, back in 2011, we first uh, went to Ethiopia. At that time, we didn't make any decision, actually, to do any investment. And we went uh, on a rural trip. And we saw some children that are suffering from hunger on the street. So actually, uh, we were in a delegation together. So together, we wrote a check of 100,000 US dollars. We gave the check to the minister of Ethiopia. We said, Minister, please take this check to buy some food for those poor children on the street. You know what happened? The minister looked at the check for about two minutes, and he returned it back to us. He said, you know what? We don't want fish from you. We want you to come to our country to teach us how to catch the fish. This is something really touched my heart. And in my first visit to Ethiopia, some of you probably also visited the capital. At that time, 2011, there's a five-star hotel called the Sheraton Hotel, as beauty as this Reese Carton, so I stayed there. So three days after I'm seeing the country, after dinner, I was digesting food, so I walked along in the beautiful gardens. And then suddenly, I hear some music, so which lead me to the back of the hotel of the Sheraton Hotel. There's a bar called the Office Bar. So I went into that bar and then looked around. At that time, I didn't see any Africans singing and dancing in the bar. I see there's a lot of European people, American people singing, dancing in the bar, which remind me of a personal story 30 years back. When I was seven years old, at that time in China, there's only one five-star hotel in Beijing called Beijing Hotel. It was my birthday. My father wanted to give me a treat. So he took me to the hotel, and we went to the reception. My ask asked the receptionist, how much is it per night? At that time, that was early 80s. The reception told my father, 100 US dollars. My father immediately said, that is too expensive. We cannot afford it. So the moment he was taking me, that little girl, seven years old, away from that beautiful hotel, the Beijing Hotel from China. I turned my head back. I looked at the ground lobby. At that moment, I thought, that beautiful world does not belong to me. That beautiful world will never belong to me. Then my life changed dramatically in the past 30 years. To be honest, I don't think it's, a, it's not about how good I am because my country find the right path of development. So the moment I was in that Sheraton Hotel, what went through to my mind is, outside the big gate of Sheraton, there must be a lot of young girls thinking exactly like me 30 years back. In their mind, inside the big gate of Sheraton, full of roses, is a world that does not belong to them. It's a world that will never belong to them. But what they don't know is, if their country can find the right path of development, their life will change dramatically. Some of the graduates might be very familiar with the leadership development course you all taken. Actually, I joined INSEAD in 2009. And actually, to be honest, I was a little bit lost businesswoman. Actually, all the people 
when I was a little bit lost, I was grown in northeast of China. Before I was 30, I thought the purpose is very simple, which is to become a good daughter. And the definition of a good daughter is study well, go to a good school, and then go to a big company and climb the corporate ladder. I did exactly that before I was 30, and that's how I actually ended my ticket two years yet. But then the question is, at that time, when I asked myself, am I truly happy? The answer is, not really. So in the leadership development course, in my one-to-one -one coaching, my coach asked me, Helen, what do you want to get out of the one-year coaching? I actually said, I said, I want happiness, something here. It's not how other people look at me. It's something has to be here. At that moment, I still remember today, my coach told me, in order to achieve the ultimate happiness for yourself, you need the four pillars in life. You need past, you need future, you need the achievement. Most importantly, you need purpose, a goal, a goal much bigger than yourself, a goal you can pursue for the rest of your life. And actually, that is how actually I would say my life from that moment started to transform. So today, to end my talk, I want to quote something Nelson Mandela once said. It always seems impossible until it's done. I'm a strong believer of business as a force for good, and I'm looking forward as an alumni to working with all of you to move from that vision to action, dreams to reality. Thank you all.